Hi, everyone, and welcome to the YIVO Institute for Jewish Research. YIVO, as you may know, is a special place for the contemplation and celebration of Jewish history and culture. YIVO's archives and library represent the single largest and most comprehensive collection of materials on Eastern European Jewish civilization in the world. So thank you for joining us for today's event, The Yiddish Historians and the Struggle for a Jewish History of the Holocaust. I'll note that throughout the event, you're welcome to type your questions into the Q&A function. We will try to answer audience questions at the end of the event. And like most of YIVO's programs, this program is being recorded and will be available afterwards on YouTube. So I encourage you to watch YIVO's many programs, recordings that are available on YouTube you know, from book talks and conversations like this, as well as concerts, academic conferences and whatnot. Um, but today's event features author Mark L. Smith in conversation with Samuel D. Casso. So I will introduce them briefly right now and then turn it over to them for the more interesting part of the lecture slash book talk, the actual conversation. So Mark L. Smith is the author of The Yiddish Historians and the Struggle for a Jewish History of the Holocaust, the subject of course of this event, which was named a National Jewish Book Award finalist and is now in paperback. He has taught Jewish history at UCLA, where he received his PhD in Jewish history in 2016. He writes and lectures on East European Jewish history and culture with a special interest in Holocaust historiography and Yiddish scholarly writing. His work has also been featured and reviewed in the Yiddish language forwards. He is currently resident scholar at American Jewish University in Los Angeles. And Samuel DiCasso is the Charles H. Northam Professor of History at Trinity College and is recognized as one of the world's leading scholars on the Holocaust and the Jews of Poland. He is widely known for his 2007 book, Who Will Write Our History, Emanuel Ringenblum, The Warsaw Ghetto, and the Oinig Shabbos Archive. He was elected a fellow of the American Academy for Jewish Research, has won numerous awards, and has lectured widely. You also may have learned from Samuel Casso in Yivo's very own self-paced online course, Discovering Ashkenaz. So with that, I will turn it over to our guests. Thanks for being here today. Okay, well, well, uh, I want to thank you and uh, the Yivo uh, a lot, very much, for uh, making this event possible. And of course, we all know just how important the Yivo was in uh, encouraging uh, the study of uh, Jewish history uh, in uh, Poland uh, before the war. Uh, the subject of my own research, uh, Emanuel Ringelblum, uh, was one of the uh, most uh, uh, involved and dedicated uh, members of the EVO historical section. Uh, before the outbreak of uh, World War II. And uh, obviously this is a subject uh, very close to my heart. And uh, I learned so much from reading Mark Smith's uh, wonderful book on uh, the Yiddish historians. Uh, and uh, the first question I'd like to ask Mark is uh, what brought you to this topic? What, what got you interested in actually writing about this? All right. Well, first, let me thank you very much for participating in this today, Sam, and to Yivo for hosting us and making this possible. Um, to answer your question, I have to go back many years and say that for about the last 30 years, um, my, my leisure reading has been in Yiddish at a time when you could buy Yiddish books in used bookstores, when people were giving away Yiddish books, when you could walk into any Jewish thrift shop and pick up a handful of Yiddish books, I began collecting Yiddish books. And I collected, well, you, you have a very wide angle camera that shows your wonderful library. You can't see mine, which is all around this room. But if I give you a quick tour, it would be anthologies, theater, music, literary criticism and history, the classics, Poetry and prose, alphabetical by author from here to here, reference works behind the Yiddish Encyclopedia, but then in that corner, history. I read widely. I followed the, the advice that people always give to read widely, but I did it in Yiddish. And I found that what drew me in all of my reading tended to be the nonfiction, tended to be the writing about Jewish history. 
And although I came from a home in which Yiddish was spoken, I didn't really learn Yiddish as a reading academic language until much later. And so I come to this somewhat as an insider outsider that I discovered the world of intellectual life in Yiddish and particularly in the writing of history as an adult and as someone who found in it what I did not expect. I found an entire cultural world that is almost still present. It's close enough almost to touch. Not quite. But as a result, I found that there were characteristics to writing in Yiddish history that we will, we will talk about, but that it's not just history written in Yiddish. It's another world that one has the privilege of dipping into. Let me say more about that as we go on. But what I found was that not only did the writing of Jewish history grab my attention, but I found that there were certain historians who were particularly interesting. And then as time went on, I began to come to the idea that there was in fact a group of historians who worked in Yiddish, who could be considered as a group, and that some of them continued to work after the Holocaust. I had intended to write about them from the beginning to the end. And the beginning is roughly after World War I, and the end is roughly the 1980s. But partly because of a suggestion by Sam and partly because of the good sense of the idea, I decided to focus on the Holocaust period. That is to say, writing Jewish history after the Holocaust, about the Holocaust. It would have been the appendix to my book, and instead it became the whole book. It is the most vivid, the most riveting, and probably the most important and influential of the Yiddish historians' works when you consider collectively what they had to say about the Holocaust. Let me go back to you for your next question. Okay, I, I just want to uh, I just want to notice uh, uh, parenthetically that when I was uh, working on my book on Emanuel Ringelblum and uh, it, it I, I I became more aware than ever of the great interest that Jews in interwar Poland took in the study of Jewish history. And we also see this, of course, in Natalia Alexion's uh, book about history in interwar Poland. Uh, the columns in the newspapers written by historians like Balaban and uh, Shipper, the popularity of historical fiction, Asha's Kiddush Hashem, Opatoshu's in Pelishevelda, Bashevis uh, Sutton in 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 uh, Gai and uh, so on. So it was a community which really lived with history. Uh, history was a subject that was real and uh, actual. Uh, it was uh, uh, played a central role in the debates going on within the Jewish community about the Jewish present and the Jewish future. It was not just an academic subject. Uh, so my next question is, uh, where's the Chiddush in this book? What do you think is new here? Uh, what are some of the discoveries that you think you've uh, made in the writing of this book? The first, the first Chiddush, the first thing that is new is really the very idea of Yiddish historians. It seems a commonplace thought at this moment that of course there were Yiddish historians. But if you do a Google search for those two words together, you will find a very rare and occasional cropping up of such a term until you come to my work. I coined a term that I thought made sense, that there are in fact historians who have something in common because they worked in Yiddish. And this has never been considered by anyone before, as far as I can tell. If you look at the original edition of the Encyclopedia Judaica, they devote one half of one sentence to the subject of writing Jewish history in Yiddish in the section in the article on his Jewish historiography. And as to Holocaust historians in Yiddish, not one word at all. 
So that is the first Kiddush, is that there is this thing called Yiddish historians, a Yiddish approach to writing Jewish history that I will discuss. And the second part of the book title is the other Kiddush, and that is that they had to struggle to write Jewish history of the Holocaust. That is to say, Holocaust history from the Jewish perspective, to write about the Holocaust as an aspect of Jewish history, as a period of Jewish history. Today, we take that for granted. We, we, we see it as natural that you would want to know what the Jews experienced during the Holocaust period. But that is not the case of the actual time right after the Holocaust. All of the histories that were being written by Jewish authors, authors like Raoul Hilberg, Gerald Reitlinger, Leon Polyakov, and Joseph Wolf, all of them were histories of what the Nazis did to the Jews. As Raoul Hilberg famously said, this is not a book about the Jews, it is a book about the people who destroyed the Jews. But these historians wrote from the Jewish perspective. I would almost have to talk about what do I mean by a Yiddish historian to, 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 to answer what am I trying to say here. Um, the whole idea of writing Jewish history in Yiddish came about because if you picture the emerging nationalities, the emerging minority peoples of Eastern Europe and Central Europe, before, during, and after World War I, unlike the United States, where we have historians and we can sort of take them or leave them because they're not critical to our understanding of ourselves, in those minority cultures, all of which lived in, all of whom lived in multinational empires, they were struggling to define a national existence and to create a national home, perhaps a nation state. And integral to that process was the idea of historians. They defined the national, the national essence. They were integral to the process of creating a nation. And this was true of what came to be called diaspora nationalism, the Yiddishist movement that said Yiddish is a national language of the Jewish people in Eastern Europe, and we have a history there, and we have a collective consciousness that results from that history, and the historians are the keepers of that consciousness. So that, interestingly, Yiddish, as you may know, as I'm sure you know, was not a highly regarded language in the 19th century, and it came to be a literary language. It came to be used for high culture purposes as the century wore on, and then eventually for intellectual purposes. But last of all of those came the profession of history. All of the historians who began to write in Yiddish had first written in other languages, Russian, Hebrew, Polish. None of them began in Yiddish. And all of them chose consciously to turn to writing in Yiddish as a means of identifying with their Ashkenazi Jewish Lanzleit, their countrymen in Eastern Europe, in whatever countries they may have lived. And they took a pan Yiddish approach. In other words, an international approach to say that Jews, Yiddish speaking Jews, wherever they might live, constitute a nation without a territory that shares a language and a history. And so they became the keepers of that part of the national flame. As a result, they created a form of writing history that was intended to serve that national purpose. They were, interestingly also, all of them to one degree or another, and there were probably, I would say, 20 historians that one might count who worked largely in Yiddish or chose to work in Yiddish. All of them that I can think of were also Zionists. They didn't regard Yiddish in competition with Hebrew or with Zionism, but they simply thought before the Holocaust that the vast majority of Jews would continue to reside in the diaspora and that their common language would be Yiddish. And so as a result, they wrote in Yiddish. Many of them also wrote at times in Hebrew and were supportive of Zionism in various ways so that this was not an either or for them, but simply the natural state of affairs that the vast majority of Jews would remain Yiddish speakers. It meant that after the Holocaust, 
they were out on a limb that had been sawn off. That the cultural footing in which they emerged and thought they would be anchored all of their lives turned to quicksand, both because of a Hebrew speaking state of Israel and principally because of the Holocaust and the wiping out of the vast majority of Yiddish speakers. But the result is that there was this worldwide conversation in Yiddish before the Holocaust, and they chose to keep it going afterwards in writing Jewish history. Let me pause there and, and defer to your next question. Okay. Uh, by the way, uh, just per, uh, perhaps in the question and uh, answer, I myself would be curious uh, to explore further uh, kind of a, uh, a, a uh, back issue which they all faced, which was that in interwar Poland, uh, there was, the, there was a, a, an increasing degree of acculturation to Polish. Uh, the Polish language Jewish press was becoming ever more important. Uh, Tartakover estimates that by 1938, about a quarter of Polish Jews were primarily Polish speaking. And uh, perhaps in the question and answer, we could kind of consider the, this whole question of what Chana Shmeru calls polylingualism in this emerging Polish Jewish culture. And by the way, we should all keep in mind that Polish Jewry between 1918 and 1939 was an ongoing work in progress. It's hard to talk about quote unquote Polish Jewry in 1918. We can certainly talk about Polish Jewry in the 1930s, but there were real regional differences and uh, the, the idea of, uh, of the emergence of a Polish Jewish identity and the role of the Yiddish language in it is a very fascinating and a very complicated question. One which we're not going to solve today, but one that we can think about. Uh, so my next question is, did you have any uh, unspoken agenda in writing this book? I do, and let me come to that in just one second, but for, I want to respond first to your, your, uh, your comment in between, the matter of language and culture and diversity. One of the peculiarities of YIVO is that not one of the founders of YIVO could be considered a Polish Jew. All were from places, no matter how broadly you construe the idea of Poland, that would be outside of Poland. And so the YIVO was created as a, 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 an international Yiddishist organization. And one of the tensions that grew up within YIVO and within Yiddish scholarship and culture in general is that the center of gravity of Yiddishist scholarship came to be in Poland. And where, for example, in the historical section of YIVO, Elias Cherikover was the head of the section and he lived in, in, in Russia, in the United States, and then in Berlin, and finally in Paris, there was this struggle between him and Ringelblum at all times over how much space should be given to Ashkenazi Jewish history in general versus Polish Jewish history in particular in the YIVO publications. And if you look at the volumes of Historische Schriften published by YIVO, the first volume in particular, you will find that the compromise was 50-50. The articles are exactly split one half in Poland, one half outside of Poland in their content. And so that this idea of pan-Yiddishism versus local Jewish history is one of the ongoing tensions. And what came to be more and more was that historians who worked in Yiddish came to be Polish Jewish historians. There was Ringelblum and Mahler, his colleague, and their teacher Schipper, and others who grew up around them who began to write in earnest in Yiddish. And they turned out to be primarily interested in Polish Jewish history. But it is an ongoing struggle to define what is their subject other than Ashkenaz broadly. Now, as to your, as to your question, 
do I have an unspoken agenda here? I do, I have two. Much broader than the subject of Yiddish historiography and broader than the Holocaust, and I'll mention it only briefly, and that is for probably the last 20 years, I've had the privilege of living with my mind and my feet in two different worlds. One, the Vochadik world that we all live in every day and do our work in, and the other is a world of Yiddish culture and Yiddish intellectual life that is simply unknown to most people today. It was a common place of life for the world of Yiddish speakers at one time. As you say, they could open any newspaper, any journal, any periodical and find stimulating writing directed at them by leading scholars. And that is a world that no one today knows existed. And you don't learn it from literature. Literature could be written in any language at any time. You write a book about something and it can be translated and it's portable but scholarship is rooted in fact and reality in a way that makes it less portable. And it becomes a conversation of reality as opposed to fiction. And therefore, one of my un unstated agendas is simply to recreate and make, make living for the reader a world that they wouldn't otherwise know about. And my second unspoken agenda is to do justice to these historians to whom justice has not been done. In a sense, they've been studied individually and they are at times, but it's almost like the analogy of recognizing famous German or American Nobel Prize winners and not noticing, not mentioning that they happen to be Jewish. In this case, historians who may be fairly well known, but not in connection with Yiddish, that they chose to connect with readers in Yiddish not only in Yiddish. It was natural to write in Polish or Russian or whatever language they was spoken in their land, but to take the deliberate choice of writing in Yiddish from which there could be little profit, but much reward spiritually, that was what they contributed. And for that, they should be recognized. And so that is my other unspoken agenda. How do you see the writing of Jewish history in, in Yiddish as being different. Why is it worth reading uh, Jewish history written in Yiddish? What I've found, and having read lots of Jewish history written in English and other languages, I found that in Yiddish there is a difference. In fact, there are several differences. The most obvious, of course, is that history written in Yiddish is written only for Jews. It is written to what Jews might consider interesting. And what does that consist of? First of all, it is internal history of Jews. Before the Yiddish historians in Eastern Europe, Jewish history was written with the Jews as the object, but not the subject. How did history treat the Jews? How did the government treat the Jews? What were Jewish rights and disabilities? What was the history of anti-Semitism? How were Jews oppressed or liberated? But no one wrote Jewish history from the inside. This is what the historians who worked in Yiddish did. They knew that their readers would want to know their own story like a family story. And so they wrote about how Jews lived, their internal culture, their literature, their arts, their religion, their foods, their clothing, their theater, everything that had to do with Jewish life. This is what they chose to write about. And they wrote in a way different also from other Jewish historians. They used the viewpoint that Salo Baron famously called the anti-lacrimose view of Jewish history, the view without tears, the view that considers Jewish history to be occasionally interrupted by catastrophes, but not colored in its essence by catastrophe and misfortune, rather a positive view of Jewish history. In all of the writings of the Yiddish historians before World War II, you could count on one hand the books and articles that they wrote about Jewish catastrophe. 
about Jews pressed into service as children in the Tsar's army, about Jews murdered or the subject of pogroms. This was not their subject. They knew that others would write about these, but they chose, chose to write about Jewish life. And they, they were aware that to do so, they needed source material. And the source material was not there in the archives. There were no state archives on the Jews. Jews had their own documents. They had their own knowledge, but it was only among the Jews. And so one of their principal activities and much supported by YIVO was the collecting of material. Shimon Dubnov, the earliest leading Eastern European Jewish historian who late in his life turned to writing a little in Yiddish, issued the famous cry, the famous call to collect, to have materials available to write Jewish history. And the Yiddish historians took this very personally. And they not only collected material from every source they could find, letters, eyewitness accounts, personal histories and reminiscences, but then they turned it around and they wrote for that audience. As Dubnov famously said at the YIVO conference in 1935 on the 10th anniversary of YIVO, the historians who work in Jerusalem at the Hebrew University, who write in, in Hebrew, they write for scholars, for specialists. But the historians at YIVO, they write for every Jewish reader, for the educated lay reader. And they did so for practical reasons. After all, how many Yiddish scholars could there be <clears throat> to support the publishing of books and articles. You, you couldn't have, have supported publications on the basis of subscriptions from Yiddish scholars, but they did so ideologically as well, that they intended to, to write for the people. They wrote a history of the people in all their writings based on materials collected from the people <clears throat> and directed toward those people. This is what is unusual about the Yiddish historian. And when it came to writing about the Holocaust after World War II, they recreated and reenacted this same culture of knowing that there would not be official documents that would talk about Jewish history during the Holocaust. Instead, they interviewed, they recorded, they collected letters, they collected anything people might have written during that period and after that period about the Holocaust. And they formed what I call in my book, a lay professional partnership in which the people became the source of their knowledge about the Holocaust. And they returned the favor by writing about the things that the people needed to know, wanted to know about what took place during that period. And they occupied a very special place. When I say that historians in Eastern Europe were part of the enterprise of nation building, it meant that these historians were also highly respected. Unlike historians in American culture who may have a certain degree of popular respect, Yiddish historians, and this would be true of all minority cultures in Eastern Europe, including Central Europe, to have a doctorate in Jewish history or in history and to write Jewish history and to be responsible for the knowledge of one's own people, this was a very prestigious thing. And anytime a Yiddish historian would write something, it would be featured, it would be highlighted. When, when one Yiddish historian, Philip Friedman, wrote a correction to a Yiddish newspaper in Israel about a mistake that he had found, they highlighted it and said a correction from Philip, from Dr. Philip Friedman, that it was an honor just to receive a correction from him that this is something we can hardly imagine, but that even the one or two who didn't have a doctorate were always called doctor because they were so highly respected. And so one has to understand that they were at the peak of an intellectual enterprise of understanding Jewish life during and after the Holocaust. Let me pause there because I know we'll run out of time if I just keep talking. Okay. I just. I just want to add parenthetically that uh, one of the things that impressed me very much as I was 
gathering material about uh, Emmanuel Ringelblum and his world before the war is just how much these historians who were determined to write in Yiddish, just how much time and energy they devoted to uh, organizing the preconditions for uh, a uh, Yiddish speaking cultural milieu, the organization of the young historian circle, the organization of the Junger Historica, the, the, one of the first Yiddish per, uh, historical periodicals entirely in the Yiddish language, the energy they devoted to developing bibliographies, the time they gave to the Yivo, the time they spent going to far-flung shtetls and spending days uh, without sleep uh, to lecture to far-flung audiences. Uh, the, the, the fact that they had to work many jobs to support themselves. This shows a real level of uh, dedication. Uh, as you read these historians' works, as you approach these historians' works, what specifically were you searching for? And, and let me put it in, in, a, in a different sense also, because the question is sort of, was I searching or was I discovering? And this would be the point at which to introduce the historians. Everyone who has signed up to watch this presentation should have seen the, the, the advertising, the, the, the page that gave the notice with five photographs of historians. These are the five historians that I feature in the book. And in the order in which you see their photos, they are Philip Friedman, Isaiah Trunk, Josef Kermisch, Nachman Blumenthal, and Mark Dvorzhetsky. All of them were born in what we would call Poland before the war, in the first years, the very first years of the 20th century. And all of them had varying degrees of Jewish education, some more religious, some more Zionist, some more Yiddishist, but all shared the desire to write Jewish history in Yiddish. And what I chose to do was to come to their works without preconceptions. The only preconception was that I was sure I would find commonalities, that I was sure I would find points of interest, but I wanted to let their works speak to me. And so I took the occasion to read all of their books and to search for their articles. Their articles are perhaps more interesting because they tend to be more revealing. Each of them wrote something more than a hundred separate articles after the Holocaust on Holocaust subjects. And I, I should say parenthetically that searching them out and finding them in journals before everything was listed online and before um, you could find digital copies of most anything online was simply an interesting task, a labor of love to go through every periodical published anywhere in the world that might contain anything, Yiskerbicher, newspapers, journals from Europe, from Israel, from the United States, and to fish out everything they wrote and then read them with, a, with an eye toward, in a sense, cross-indexing what they had to say. What were the themes that emerged? What became their guiding concerns. And what I found was that above all, what they wrote about was Jewish life during the Holocaust, most surprisingly, not Jewish death. Their subject was life. They weren't in denial. They all knew how the story ended. So did their readers. They didn't have to tell their readers the end of the story. That was well known. But what their readers wanted to know was what happened to our people during that time? How did they live? What did they suffer? How did they struggle? And what they found was that Jewish life continued in the ghettos. And they tended not to write about the camps because that's already almost over the line into writing about how Jews died but they wrote about Jewish life in the ghettos. They wrote about the Jewish councils, the imposed governing bodies that the Germans, that the Nazis required the Jews to organize themselves with. They wrote about how food was acquired and provisioned and how an economy developed. They wrote about inequities. They wrote about social justice and injustice. Uh, 
Uh, Yosef Kermish would say, for example, that in the Warsaw Ghetto, where the powerful couldn't be taxed, the Jews who had money kept money, and those who were poor remained poor, and the only taxes were on consumption, uh, what we would call a value-added tax or a sales tax, that he said any European country today would be ashamed to balance its budget on the basis of a consumption tax. But that was the reality that they lived with in the ghettos, was that they had to deal with the power structure that existed in Jewish society before the war. And that was that there were haves and have nots. And that was an unfortunate state of affairs. And Philip Friedman would write that that only pertained in the beginning, that then there was the pauperization of the entire Jewish populate, population, the, the, the declassing of all and the arising of new classes of those who could somehow make it in the ghetto. And so they wrote about everything. They wrote about political life. Unlike today, Jews in Eastern Europe had been organized before the war by political parties. Everyone's social life and intellectual life revolved around the party they belonged to, whether it was Bundist or socialist or Zionist or communist or any mixture of the various possibilities. And this continued in the ghettos. The education that was given, the schools that were organized, the theater that was presented, everything came from the circles of people who continued to try to live the lives they had before. This is, this is what they wrote about. And this is what I found in their writing. And I tried to let it speak to me so that the chapters in my book are how it laid itself out before me. And I hope I've done them justice to say that these were what matters were important to them. Let me, let me go to your next question, time runs. What are their most important contributions to our understanding of the Holocaust? When it comes right down to it, the first contribution is in a sense a smaller one, and that is that they focused attention on the Jewish history of the Holocaust. In their time, as I said, this was not common. And you would think if you didn't read the Yiddish historians that people became interested in the Jewish history of the Holocaust only much later, only after the Eichmann trial, only after Hannah Arendt and and Bruno Bettelheim wrote about things that disparaged Jewish conduct during the Holocaust, that only in the 1960s did people start to write about the Jews, but not so. These people began writing in the mid 1940s. And by 1960, they had whole bodies of work. But there was one question that haunted them above all others. I call it the question of questions. And the, and the question was, what all their readers wanted to know, what every survivor wanted to know. How could this have happened to us? How could this catastrophe have befallen us? How could we have let it happen to us? Could we have prevented it? Could we have resisted it? And they fashioned first a defense. And the, and the, and the defense they fashioned was all the reasons why it was next to impossible for Jews to resist. The shortage of weapons, being cut off from all possible allies, the terrain, the hostility of local populations, the being cast back on one's heels at all times, being kept by the Germans in constant turmoil, that one could never settle down to a routine. There was never daily life in a set predictable fashion, that there was always this sense of being off balance, that one could never gather strength. And this flows in all of their writings, a little piece here and there and there. And if you gather it together, as I do in my fifth chapter, you begin to understand all the reasons why Jews shouldn't be accused of being passive, of, of failing to resist. And even then, Nachman Blumenthal says, so what if they did go to their fates like sheep to the slaughter? Are the sheep to blame? And he says this in four different essays over many years. The sheep are innocent. One must remember that it is the executioner who is guilty. Don't blame the victim, he says. And then they fashioned an offense, a way of saying, not only don't blame us and not only 
understand why we couldn't resist, but they drew on their own experience. All five of these historians were survivors. All of them in the course of that period lost their wives, their children. After the war, they remarried, they had new families. As Mark Dvorzhetsky said, other peoples who survived returned to their families. The Jews could return only to their people. And he would say that when you see a young couple walking down Dizengoff in, in Tel Aviv, each one of them remembers their spouse from before the war. Each one of them is two. And when you see two walking, you are, you are seeing four. They knew that there was this collective memory of all the people lost and all of their struggles. And they said, what's missing from this discussion is all the ways that people tried to resist, all the unarmed means of resistance. And Dvorzhetsky was the one who pioneered in this. He said, let us remember all the ways that Jews tried to resist without weapons. In 1946, in his most important essay, in Yiddish, published in Paris, he wrote, varied were the ways of resistance. And he said, will the future historian think it was futile to write literature in the ghettos? Will the future historian think it was foolish to worry about bread when people were dying? Should they have been trying to shoot with, with guns they didn't have? Or was it sensible to try to smuggle food into the ghettos? All the mothers who died trying to bring food into their children, all the people who tried to barter with Christians out, Christian neighbors on the Aryan side, as it was called, outside the ghetto walls. Are these not the real heroes that we should celebrate? Will not the future historian write about those people? And as in much of his writing, what he wrote was predictive because he became that historian. He was the one who said, we must honor and remember and recognize all the ways the Jews struggled to stay alive. And oddly enough, none of the Yiddish historians ever said what was most obvious. And that was without all those means of struggle, no one would have survived. Hardly anyone survived because of armed resistance. It was all the unarmed, passive, spiritual, and daily chores that people engaged in that made it possible for anyone who is today called a Holocaust survivor to have survived. There are people who have written about this from various perspectives. Laura Jokish, for example, in her book, Collect and Record, writes about the historians in the early years after the war who formed the historical commissions in which all of these historians were active in various ways. Natalia Alexiun has written about some of these historians in her most recent book, Conscious History, in the period before the war. And Boaz Cohen has written about these historians in certain ways in his book, Israeli Holocaust Research. And everyone has their own view, their own take, their own perspective. One can see these people in, through a variety of lenses. I have chosen to see them through the Yiddish lens because they chose to speak to a Yiddish audience, not only to a Yiddish audience, but they chose to identify with that world. And that's the world that I've, that I've tried to bring to life and to keep alive with this book. And if they have one major contribution it is that, it is that they have changed the way we see the Jews during the Holocaust period. It has now become normative. If you look at Yad Vashem's website on Jewish resistance, the pages they have there, you will see that it includes very strongly the idea of passive and unarmed resistance. And I think that's the contribution of these historians, that they have put that front and center if you look at all the recent writing about resistance during the Holocaust, no longer does one say Jews either rose up with arms and died as heroes or were simply slaughtered. One recognizes the daily struggle. I think that's their largest contribution. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, I, 
very much uh, hope that uh, many of you who are listening will uh, have a chance to read this, this very important book. Uh, and hopefully we, we now have time for uh, questions and uh, perhaps Jane can moderate the uh, questions to Mark. Sure, so I'll start off with one of our first questions um, from an audience member and they say it's directed to Mark or Samuel, either of you. And here's the question. Given that the roots of Yiddish are in good part medieval German, was there discussion amongst the Yiddish historians after the Holocaust about the Jewish cultural and linguistic ties to Germany, the instigator of the Holocaust? Interesting question. Well, first, I would have to reframe, and I, pardon me, Sam, I'll, I'll give you a chance, too. I didn't mean to preempt you. No, no, this, um, is, this is for you. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, the question, forgive me for saying, is based up, upon the idea that Yiddish is a dialect of German. It is not. This is one of the great, great themes and arguments of Yiddish linguistics and Yiddish history. Yiddish and German both descend from common ancestors, but neither is the answer, neither one is the ancestor of the other. As it was famously said, an army, I said it wrong, a, a language is a dialect with an army and navy. It is one a question of strength and position, but not necessarily of lineage. And so I would have to say no. In that sense, Yiddish historians did not find a cultural affinity with German and German culture in that sense. There, there was an understanding that Jews who could speak German tended to fare better under the Nazis because they were able to serve as intermediaries and were perhaps respected a bit more. But no, I would simply have to say it's a very interesting question, but culturally there isn't that type of overlap. And in fact, quite the opposite. Um, there was a whole period in early Yiddish scholarship in the early 1900s when Yiddish was in a sense, corrected by scholars to make it more German. And then there was a backlash in the 1930s when scholars like Max Weinreich would, would de-Germanicize Yiddish, would insist on removing undue influence of German on Yiddish. And this would be certainly true after the Holocaust, that, that Yiddish scholars would speak of German culture as a very separate culture. Jane. All right, so another question we have, this one is a bit broad, but I think is quite interesting. So answer it however you'd like. Um, were there any boundaries or everything in all capitals, everything open to discuss, describe, analyze self-censorship via the writers or editors? What did the, what did the public want or not want to read? was one subject that was touchy, and that would be the Jewish councils, the Judenrat, and how Jews behaved in the sense of collaborating with the Germans or not. Jews on rare occasion were found to be collaborators with the German occupying forces for their own individual benefit, as might be true in any occupied population. And the only instance that I have found in all of the reading that I have done is that in Israel, for a brief period, during the controversy that had to do with collaborators and possible misdeeds of certain Jews during the war in the early years of the Jewish state, there was one instance of an article written by Yosef Kermish about Jewish life in the Warsaw Ghetto, in which a, a few passages were deleted. And this was in the journal published by Avram Sutzkever in the Golden Akate. 
in which a few passages that were critical of Jewish comportment in relation to the Germans disappeared in that edition of his writing. It had been published elsewhere in full. I can think of no other instance in which that would be the case, that no topic was out of bounds. In fact, very much the opposite. Isaiah Trunk, for example, wrote a great deal about social conflict in the ghettos, what we might call class conflict. So did Philip Friedman. The ethical dilemmas faced by those in the ghettos, how they treated one another. Nachman Blumenthal wrote a very fine essay on the subject of Jewish comportment, all having to do with how did Jews conduct themselves and what we might say honorably or not. And, and they didn't flinch from pointing out failings. Um, they wanted to be very realistic. And Dvorzhetsky famously said, let us tell the whole truth. Let us be sure that we write about those who behaved in ways that we might not be proud of because that's all of Jewish history together. And I must say they did not find overwhelming instances of what we would not wish to hear about, but it's there when they find it. Self-censorship would be something you don't find here. It's the rarest exception. So perhaps on a related note, this next question um, in terms of truth, if writing from within on history from a Jewish angle to Jews, how could or did they, the Jewish historian writers, convey history with a clear eye, dispassionate, uh, uninvolved perspective? Or is that the whole purpose, to write with a totally Jewish angle and not be distant from the reporting? And if that, in the historian's code, for appropriate for accuracy and unbiased writing? It's one of the most difficult questions because it takes you to the whole subject of Saul Friedlander and the historic strike in, in, in Germany in the 1980s, in which German historians of the Holocaust period would accuse Jewish historians of the impossibility of being impartial, that only Jews couldn't write about the Holocaust impartially. Philip Friedman struggled with this in one of his most important essays in 1948 in which he asked, is it possible to be objective? Is it possible to be impartial? And he said, on the one hand, we are separated from that period by so much blood and so much loss that we are already freed of our constraints. And at the same time, he said, we must understand that Jews view history differently, that every other people's heroes tend to be our demons. We cannot expect the world to share our view of Napoleon or Herod. Uh, Herod's a bad choice of other Roman emperors. I mean, um, that, that all of those who were the great heroes to their peoples tended to be the monsters of Jewish history. And we have to understand that that's our view of Jewish history. So he was very self-conscious about this. He did not expect that the world would share Jews' views necessarily, but he felt, he and all of them felt very strongly that they could be impartial arbiters of what was so. These were historians raised in a much simpler time. They were what we would today call positivist historians who believed that it was possible to uncover the past, know it, write about it, and set it forth in a way that you could say, yes, I've done so. We know that writing history is much more complicated than that in a postmodern era, but they took truth to be an essential and, and their duty to the truth as they saw it. And they would, they would struggle with making sure that they did justice to their subject by never, never presenting a varnished view or a, a biased view as they saw it. That's the best I can answer the question. Sam, do you have a thought on that? Well, this was, this was one of the most difficult questions that these Jewish historians faced because uh, the, the, the historical profession in Poland, uh, the Jewish historical profession developed with a view that Jewish historians were soldiers. 
using history to defend Jewish honor and Jewish rights, as, especially against such Polish historians as Rybarski, who were using history to show the Jews had weakened Poland and set Poland up for the partitions. So on the one hand, history was a weapon, but on the other hand, they were dedicated to the ideal of objective scholarship. Uh, even when uh, that objective scholarship uncovered facts which were not complementary uh, to, to, to uh, Jews. And it's a, it, it's a problem that they were aware of and never lost sight of. Uh, but by and large, uh, when push came to shove, they remained true to the ideal of objective scholarship. Our next question. Did you detect any trope of despair or depression in the writers or expressed inner conflicts about staying or fleeing their homelands after the war? Well, those, those are two very different questions. Um, the subject of despair, no, no, oddly enough. In fact, Philip Friedman wrote in a review of various people's writings referring specifically to Nachman Blumenthal that in Blumenthal's writings, you don't find him discovering despair, that Blumenthal writes about poets and writers who worked during the Holocaust, and that you find energy, you find striving for life, that nowhere do you find despair. Whether this is absolutely true, one could debate, but it was their view that you didn't find people working and writing during the Holocaust on subjects that were fatalistic, that the books that were borrowed from the library in Vilna that became so popular as a lending library during the Holocaust period in the ghetto, um, they tended to be about exploits of Jewish history that were heroic. People were interested in how Jews survived in prior times. The first, and, the first book published in the Warsaw Ghetto before it was sealed off um, was a book of an, an anthology of writing on Jewish history that featured all the great Jewish historians and, and all about how Jews resisted throughout history, throughout all the periods. There was, there was optimism, uh, strangely. In fact, Dorzhetsky writes that one of the things that did the Jews in, one of the things that paralyzed the Jews was their optimism, was that they simply couldn't believe that their fate was sealed. And so the Yiddish historians took that view all along, that, that they were writing about a vibrant period of Jewish history. Now, as to their post-war lives, um, those who went back to Poland, uh, not Dworzecki, who went to Paris, but the others who went to Poland, understood the problem of Stalinism and communism and knew that they simply had to get out, that they couldn't be free to work in Poland. And so several went to Israel and some came to America. They despaired of Jewish life after the war in Poland, but not for Jewish reasons. I think we have time for one more question, if that's okay. So this is a question that um, hopefully can point to the, what the future of this research will be. So I'll note that for those who have not yet purchased the book or read it, there is a considerable section at the end of the book, which is devoted to the bibliographies of the major Jewish historians. So I'm curious if you could let us know, Mark, your intention in including all of this in the book and perhaps which particular research endeavors do you hope may come out of others using this text as a tool? Indeed, this was part of my purpose, was not merely to write what I had to say, but to make these historians available. And I began this research at a time when the internet had nothing. I'm a little embarrassed now to see how much work I put into things that if I had waited another 10 years would have been so easy. But I found that there was no bibliography of these historians. Philip Friedman had written his own bibliography of his own works, which included almost everything. And in fact, it's quite interesting because he, he makes it a continuous bibliography from his earliest years to his late, latest years. And there's just a period in the early 1940s that's a little bit scant, but he never comments on it. There's the Holocaust, but his life is continuous. His work is continuous. I wanted to give that 
ongoing life to each of these historians. And so I, I, I made the effort to produce bibliographies that are in, in total a hundred and some pages so that others would not have to repeat my basic research, that they would be able to move a step forward and take these as the starting point for their research. And the publisher was kind enough to allow me a few more thousand words even to put in the translation of each of the titles of their works so that you, if you don't read Yiddish, you at least have the sense of it in an English translation. That was a major goal, was that my work shouldn't end with what I'm writing, but it should be a beginning, both for me and for all the people that I see are interested today in these people and these stories. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much to both of you for this very illuminating discussion. And thank you all for joining us here watching this event. Uh, we hope you consider joining YIVO for future events. You're welcome to learn more about YIVO by going to our website, subscribing to us on YouTube, signing up for our email list. Um, and we look forward to having all of you join us at our next programs. So thank you very much for the two of you. And I hope everyone has